little background, I get thrilled sometimes with looking at the history of how things happened. Many of our missions that you'll hear about, you'll hear essentially in isolation, just the specifics of that mission, but many of them are entwined in a much larger history of what's gone on in the space program. Uh, and Kobe has its own unique history, which I note has been influenced by the White House and by what I call NASA's self-inflicted management complexity. Uh, you'll see in a minute exactly what I mean by that. Let's go back a little bit. Go back to the late 60s. The trio you see on the left there, President Nixon, uh, NASA Administrator Tom Paine, and Vice President Spiro Agnew. In April of 1969, they gathered, this was when uh, Tom Paine was uh, in place as the, the NASA Administrator. Uh, later that year, the Agnew Group put out a report, the Space Task Group, which had all sorts of options for follow-on to the Apollo program. You might say, what has that got to do with Kobe? What that did was present an opportunity for President Nixon, shown down below there with Administrator then Jim Fletcher, essentially buying the shuttle, the space shuttle. The NASA intent at that time was to have a space station done simultaneously with the shuttle. The shuttle would be essentially just the transportation to and from the space station. But with the turn down of the space station at that time and approval only of the space shuttle, the whole utility and plans for the space shuttle changed and it became the primary launch vehicle downstream for NASA and set up what has turned out to be 50 years of what I call angst for space science and being essentially pushed on to using the space shuttle as one of its prime launch vehicles. I might note uh, that of the characters you see up here on the left, the chap on the right, Spiro Agnew, uh, was convicted of income tax evasion and sentenced to three months in prison. Uh, it was a sp suspended sentence, so he remained free. Uh, Tom Paine lasted about another year and a half, and he didn't get what he really wanted in the follow-on human spaceflight program, so he left, replaced by Jim Fletcher. And then the chap on the left there uh, resigned after something called Watergate. So you see, those, that trio has quite a history <laughs> and set up the whole game plan for Kobe. <laughs> now, let, let's look at it. A web of challenges. You'll, you'll hear a little bit from John and Dennis about many of the challenges involved in getting the mission implemented. We go back to 1974. AO6 <coughs> solicited explorers for the period of 78 to 82 flight opportunities. They were to be launched on either a Delta or a Scout. And that shuttle was mentioned. And by 1976, it was mandated in NASA that all launches of anything would be on the space shuttle. The plan was to phase out the Atlas, phase out the Scout, phase out the Delta, and phase out the Titan as a NASA utilized launch vehicle. Uh, I resisted that and told the administrator, the deputy, that that was not a good idea. At that time, the expendables were in the space science directorate. Uh, several weeks later, that was changed. And the expendables went from space science over to manned space flight, where indeed they would be phased out. And space science inherited that wonderful discipline called space life sciences. So I got the flying frog odolith in exchange for launch vehicles. <laughs> then, a little, little bit later, at Goddard in the 1980s, we had a lot of discussion about how one maintains in-house expertise and 
gets the hands-on experience. So it was decided at that time to do COBE entirely as an in-house mission, essentially led out of the engineering directorate. This caused some consternation in the flight projects directorate at the time, uh, but Bill Keithley said, okay, that's the way we want to do it, that's the way we'll do it. And it was an incredible learning experience, providing hands-on experience across the total range of disciplines, as both John and Dennis will be able to tell you in a little bit, and is the essential ingredient element of any center's ability <coughs> to manage missions. If you don't have the in-house expertise and experience, you're not going to be very good at managing the external world and the contractor community. So Challenger, of course, just totally changed the landscape. Uh, Kobe, as you heard Dante talk, was redesigned to go from the shuttle launch onto a Delta II which it successfully did, and was totally, totally changed in terms of the structure. You'll hear about that, but it was a challenge that was met by the center at the time and resulted eventually in an incredible mission, which had the, the launch and total mission success, which you'll again hear more about. Sometimes success is totally recognized. Here you see our next speakers. Leadership was really the hallmark of both John and Dennis and the rest of the Kobe team. They were recruiting over in Sweden. I don't know, John, if you uh, got your colleague there to join in with your next mission. Well, you see the two fellows here on the right, and we're going to now see them in person. But our next speaker will be John Mather. Noel, thank you. I, I should actually make a small correction. I'm not the PI for the Kobe mission. I was project scientist. Slightly different job. <clears throat> and uh, Paul Hertz was reminding me why our mission wasn't on the list of, of explorers. It's because it wasn't a PI mission. It was a big explorer, and it had three PIs and a science team and uh, serious project managers uh, who actually made it really work. So um, anyway, um, I want to tell you a little bit of the story of the project as I saw it. And I was uh, um, interested to hear Noel's take on the self-inflicted management complexity that we got. When, um, that wasn't the half of it. <laughs> <laughs> you can uh, hear more, uh, perhaps more privately from people, uh, but we had to deal with something called uh, matrix, matrix management, uh, which means everybody has divided loyalty and multiple bosses, and that's a bad idea. So uh, that's probably all I should say about it. You can quiz us more later. <clears throat> so I wanted to tell you a few of the lessons learned from the project, uh, which basically uh, amount to, uh, as they say on Car Talk, don't drive like my brother. Uh, <laughs> So let's see if I can get the uh, slides to move forward. One of these buttons must do it, right? Okay, that one is it. Uh, these are what I take as my four top lessons that I got from, from life here. <clears throat> Number one, um, I was pretty overworked on the Kobe project. And uh, so as a, a sort of basic point, the structure of the team has to be correct, has to be set up so that no one person is as essential as he or she thinks. Um, and so, um, the PI may think he or she is very smart, and probably is, uh, but that doesn't mean he or she should do all the work or make all the decisions, uh, because that's definitely a recipe for failure as well as burnout. It's a high-risk plan. Now, we happened to set up our program uh, during uh, many hiring freezes, and so it wasn't so easy to change this, uh, but it was a serious risk that our project took uh, without having enough people in some of the right places. Uh, sort of item number two is uh, actually a lesson from my graduate school program. If you do not test it, it will not work. Uh, people imagine that there's such a thing as taking risk by not doing a test. And as far as I'm concerned, taking risk by not doing a test is like uh, filling the uh, revolver with bullets in all the chambers and pointing it. <laughs> so uh, don't do that. Uh, you're gambling with public money and your career if you do that. Um, the uh, hardware has a mind of its own. Uh, my robots in my house are all re on rebellion today. Light switches don't work. The furnace doesn't work. 
And so, uh, you know, stuff goes wrong, and if you do not test it, it will not work. It's not a matter of chance. Um, a third point is that as a PI, you are basically a science systems engineer. And so there is such a thing as a serious science systems engineering program and, and discipline these days, which was a lot more seat of the pants when we did it. And uh, when we did it, it was, for Kobe, uh, people had pieces of paper and uh, slide rules and pocket calculators, and we thought we had to actually figure everything out on the back of an envelope first. Uh, and we still need to do that, but now we have finite element codes to tell you if your story that you have on your back of your envelope is actually correct. Uh, so there's a new discipline that didn't really exist in the formal way that it did when, uh, now, that it does now when we started. In fact, uh, when we started this project, the world was a lot different. It was uh, five years after, we were sending proposals in five years after the Apollo moon landing, the first one. And so uh, the world was young, is the way it feels to me. Uh, a last point here is that, and I think I knew this even before Charlie Pellerin wrote his little book, um, it takes a wide range of personalities to make a complete team. Uh, I like Charlie's book, uh, How NASA Builds Teams. I also remember that when he spoke to the NASA executives uh, uh, meeting uh, maybe a year ago and we handed out copies of his book, uh, somebody piped up and said, well, Charlie, how come you didn't read this book before you did your job? Or something like that. Because <laughs> people, people knew that he was actually uh, learn some of this afterwards. <laughs> so uh, anyway, uh, but I think it's a wonderful book and I do encourage you to read it. Uh, so what is the project? I think you've seen this picture in a number of different ways. Um, this is the Kobe as it was after uh, the, the, the first redesign when it went from the Delta launch to the shuttle launch, then uh, it went from the shuttle back to the Delta, this is it. Uh, Dennis may tell you a little bit more about how this really happened, but Dennis was a very key player in making that happen, and he'll perhaps tell you more of the details. Um, <clears throat> there were no Delta rockets available when we needed a Delta rocket. And so you couldn't just say, well, I want a Delta rocket. <laughs> they just didn't exist. So anyway, in the top is the instrument package. There's a tank of liquid helium in there that lasted for 10 months, uh, at one and a half degrees Kelvin. Uh, cooling down two of the instruments to that temperature and around the outside of the helium tank are three microwave receiver boxes and those were used uh, to make a map of the cosmic background radiation. The uh, bird is still up there. It's in orbit about the same place we put it. Uh, it'd still be there for maybe a thousand years from now. Uh, finally, it'll come down. Uh, so um, anyway, it's up there and spinning. Um, I will show you a little bit more about how this came to be. Uh, Noel told you some of this. Uh, we proposed it in 1974. Uh, when I arrived at Goddard, by the way, there was a computer in my desk drawer. It was round. It had two pointers on it. Uh, and it was a high quality one because it was eight inches in diameter. Uh, so hardly anybody could type. Uh, we didn't have computer aided design really. There was an elementary version of Nastran, uh, which we did use, but you couldn't just say, I think I'll draw it up on the computer and see if it fits. So we even had serious problems about stuff actually fitting together after you'd made it. So uh, things have changed a lot since then. Uh, when we uh, conceived of our program, uh, the whole idea was far beyond the state of the art. The detectors were not available. Uh, the accuracy requirements were unprecedented. We were going to make parts per million measurements of things. And there was almost no experience with cryogenic equipment in space. So there was some, but not, not nearly enough to make this easy. So uh, this became an in-house project. As Noel mentioned, it was, I believe, the largest Goddard had ever done. Um, and although we achieved success, there were people who said afterwards, we'll never do that again. That was too hard for us. Uh, now a uh, point about the science role, uh, there were two of the three principal investigators were civil servants. I was one, Mike Hauser was the other. The third one was uh, George Smoot at Berkeley, and all of us had interesting challenges to, m to manage along with this uh, situation. If you're in-house, then you have lots of bosses, and you don't have the money in your hands, so you might imagine as a PI that you're the boss, but you're not. Um, if you're external, at Berkeley you certainly do not have the money in your hand because NASA is building the instrument with you for you, and so you do not have the budget there either. So you might think that he who has the gold rules, well, uh, you have to be friends with the people who actually have the money. <laughs> and, and we did. Uh, we, uh, we pulled this off, but this was one of those management complexities that's different for each project, because most projects don't have uh, NASA PIs uh, in charge of everything. So. Um, some uh, other lessons to, to gain from this. Um, I mentioned already that it's bad to uh, over, overwork your, your people. I was both a project scientist and a principal investigator, and I think that was actually a bad idea. I would not recommend that. Um, 
it's essential to have uh, print, uh, deputies, and um, I mentioned that already. Um, and I think I mentioned also that we didn't have actual financial authority, um, but it worked. Uh, and in truth, to tell you the truth, I'm not great with financial control. Uh, I think my job is better to be a scientist, and I'd rather trust accountants, managers, and systems engineers to do their job rather than trying to do that for them. Uh, so what were the, how did we get our requirements? Uh, well, we, um, we had quite a, a lot of difficulty producing requirements documents. Uh, Dennis may remember uh, the early phases and even the middle phases. Uh, we, we said we wanted to measure the cosmic background of radiation to incredible precision. There was no way to flow that down, as engineers say, to uh, detailed d design requirements. Uh, nobody actually knew how to accomplish this, so we had to do a tremendous number of iterations. It made engineers very uncomfortable uh, because why don't those scientists know what they want? And uh, well, we don't know what we want because we never did this before, and we don't know if this idea will work either. So uh, we did a lot of iterations and uh, caused a lot of grief, but eventually we got there. And the only way that it could be done successfully, I think, is the way that we did do it with an in-house team where the scientists and engineers could work very closely together. There was no contract manager between you and your, and your engineering team. I could walk into any of the engineers' labs any day and talk with them about anything. And they could call me up and say, you know, I don't like what you just asked us to do. Are you sure you have to have it that way? Let's talk. And so we did a lot of iterations, and, and it worked out. Um, we actually seriously thought about contracts for these kinds of things before the decision was made to bring it in-house. And I don't think any of the scientists could imagine making a contract for the instrument that we needed. So I talked about the need for um, a range of personalities. Uh, it takes all types, really, to make something work. Uh, you have to have the person who says, this is really worth doing. This is a, a fabulous opportunity. Uh, we, if we did this, we could maybe earn a Nobel Prize, although none, I don't think any of us were seriously thinking about that at the time. Uh, somebody has to actually make decisions every day, uh, even if they're wrong, because you won't find out if they're wrong until you make them. Um, you have to have some people who are much more detail-oriented, the people who make the spreadsheets with the check boxes, uh, but we absolutely have to have those. We have to have the grouches who say you must test everything enough. Uh, we had some on our team who were grouchy enough to say we have to test everything, and I was sure glad we did. There were uh, there are some stories in the book, the, the very first light where this, our project story is told, where you can hear about the particular individuals who said, this isn't going to work if you don't test it, we better do this test. And uh, I don't want to tell all the stories today, but um, anyway, very important. Um, here's something that you PIs might have, I had. Uh, if you're the PI, people think you're right. And you might not be. So how are you going to know? Um, so as I say, you were a single point failure walking on Earth. So watch out. Uh, there were a few cases where I actually, it's one very clear in my mind. I woke up in the middle of the night and I said, everybody's trusting me on this design for the calibrator for the spectrometer, and it's wrong. So I, I was lucky. I was able to go in the next day and talk to our thermal engineer. And she said, well, we'll work together. We'll find a way. And we did find a way. We changed that design. We got the calibrator to cool down enough. But if that hadn't been done, the mission would have failed. And so there are lots of things where you don't even know that you're the one that's made a mistake. So um, I had n there are plenty more stories to tell about this kind of thing. But just because you're the PI doesn't mean you're right. Uh, and you need actually to do something active to make sure that somebody finds out your mistakes. So uh, there's an attitude issue that I like to remind people about. Um, that basically attitude can get you into trouble more than mis even mistakes. Uh, if you make a mistake and you catch it, that's all right. If you make a mistake and you don't catch it because you think you know what you're doing, that's a problem. So um, if somebody says, well, we don't think we need to make that test, uh, we don't, we've run out of money or whatever, or if people are angry with you for some reason, then it's just too bad. Uh, you may make a serious fatal mistake. So just don't do that. Uh, think about the attitude of your team and make sure that it's generally upbeat and positive and that it's a can-do sort of team but not a risky team. So uh, just a few pictures of the science. Uh, Dante gave you some science and here's a little bit of it. This is my original version of the spectrum chart. Uh, this says the, the Big Bang Theory is the smooth curve and the little boxes are all the measurements that we made after nine good minutes of data uh, six weeks after launch and so the 
Astronomy Society said this was really cool, and they cheered. Uh, two years later, we got these maps. Uh, these are maps of the hot and cold spots in the background radiation. When Stephen Hawking saw this, he said it was the most important scientific discovery of the century, if not of all time, and I thought that was pretty cool, too. Um, <laughs> so um, I think Dante's already sort of given you a little bit of why it was important, but uh, let me just say that uh, the map on the lower left is a whole sky map of the microwave radiation brightness. Um, the hot and cold spots correspond to density variations in the Big Bang material, uh, and if there were no regions that were a little more dense than average, there would be no galaxies and no people. So this is a map of our origins in principle, though our particular Earth is not on this map because we're in the middle. Uh, we're surrounded by this map instead. So a few words about the new project that I'm working on, this James Webb Space Telescope. It's a completely, radically different organization. This is much, much larger. It's an order of magnitude bigger project. Uh, it's an international project with the European and Canadian Space Agency uh, chipping in significant pieces of their budgets. Uh, this is a, a successor for the Hubble Space Telescope. And we started off uh, uh, with initial studies of this in the fall of 1995, so it's getting to be 14 plus years. Uh, it took a long time to make the negotiation of the international arrangements for this project, uh, but now you see some of them listed here. Um, the United States is building the uh, part you can see here, the observatory and the telescope. Um, the instrument package uh, is hidden behind the telescope, and you can't see all of it there. Uh, the United States is building some of it. We're building the near-infrared camera, which is the most important part in many ways. Europeans are chipping in the near-infrared spectrograph and half of the mid-infrared instrument. The Canadians are chipping in the fine guidance sensor. Um, and the United States is actually the source of detectors for all of the instruments. Uh, and so it's a wonderfully complex hybrid arrangement, uh, which has nevertheless been made to function. And uh, I'd say uh, it's a uh, pretty remarkable accomplishment of management uh, to, to make this thing go. And to me, the biggest surprise is the European piece of the mid-infrared instrument has about 14 partners making it go. And I thought that would never work. But they actually were the first ones to produce a working test instrument. So uh, what I think about management isn't actually reliable. <laughs> so uh, uh, you can get a good surprise. ITAR has turned out to be a bigger trouble, however, than we ever imagined it would be because it got worse and worse and worse, and it's still getting worse. Uh, maybe it'll get better. Anyway, the telescope is six and a half meters across. Um, it's a segmented, adjustable, deployable telescope. It's much bigger than the rocket, so it will deploy after launch. It cools down to 40-something uh, Kelvin uh, so that it does not glow too much in the infrared. It's going up according to plan in, in 2014 on the Ariane rocket, which is European one. Uh, and going a million miles from here to the L2 point. So um, anyway, that's a quick summary. There are many scientific programs we anticipate people will carry out. Um, to talk a little bit about the science roles in here, uh, just a few words about how this the, uh, program was organized. Back in uh, 1995, when we were starting the study, there was a draft <coughs> report from a committee that said uh, we need one of these telescopes. It did not say it has to be segmented in large. But they would just said four meters, because that's the size you, kn you knew you could fit into the rocket. Well, it didn't take too long before ambition went up. Uh, and so we went up to eight meters, then it came back down to six and a half, which is actually all you can pack into that rocket. So in 1995, we didn't know everything that we would want to study, but there was a whole lot that was uncertain. But uh, anyway, we did anticipate almost everything that people are now interested in. So how do you get uh, this figured out? Well, you ask lots of committees. So I got to chair lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of science team meetings, and I'm still doing it. Um, so I'll come to the end, and I think, uh, I don't know whether I talk for my time limit, but questions are good. So thanks. Could we do Kobe now? The same program now in the environment you're in. And I remember saying two years ago, my attitude is just tell me what the rules are and we'll work around them. <laughs> I, and I said work around them. I didn't mean it that way, but I said it. So. I think the thing that struck us all when we developed this program was that it had to be perfect. I mean, what John was trying to measure and what the other two scientists were trying to measure, this was just not a normal spacecraft that might have noise on it or wheels spinning. This had to be close to being a perfect spacecraft. 
The two of the instruments are in liquid helium, and I can tell you that there are people here, Orlando Figaro and others, <clears throat> there was a 100% failure rate of anything we put in a test door and took it down to liquid helium. It was either materials, it was electrical cables, it was detectors, and we wore out every test door we had. And the reason I tell you some of this, because some of you are gonna build instruments and build spacecraft, and there's some of these lessons, even if there's a 100% failure rate, if you just keep persevering and moving on, you can accomplish this. When COBE was designed for the shuttle, it was close to 12,000 pounds. And after the Challenger accident, we evaluated every launch vehicle in the world from the Chinese Long March to the Ariane to the Russian vehicle to an Atlas to a Delta. We spent five months determining, could we put this on another rocket? It turns out that a, a Delta vehicle can go to 900 kilometers and the shuttle can go to 300 kilometers. So that was a big difference and the fact was we could take off a 4,000 pound hydrazine propulsion system from the shuttle design and get down to 8,000 pounds. And then when you have a shuttle structure versus a delta structure, we saved 3,000 pounds. But I remember getting a call from the chief scientist at NASA headquarters every six weeks. Tell me, Dennis, how you got from 12,000 to 5,000? <laughs> John, John has shown you this. What, what this was in, in the shuttle program, this, was, this is 15, 14 feet across. So this entire spacecraft was down here. And to get on a delta, everything had to be folded up. The, the, the sun shield was folded, the solar rays were folded, the antenna was folded. So if you put everything compact, you can get it down to a five foot diameter versus a 14 foot shuttle. And this is what we did. I think what Noel pointed out, this, this was a training program and the other point is you could not have developed these instruments out of house. I, there's, I don't think there's any way anybody could have written a specification and sent it to a company and try to develop these instruments on any type of budget or cost. These were brand new. As I mentioned, there was a 100% failure rate in the test doers. You couldn't have sent this out. The other thing was, it was a training program, and I think most of NASA and Goddard recognized it. Well, the chief engineer at NASA worked on COBE. The director of engineering, Orlando Figaro, worked on COBE. The deputy director of NOAA worked on COBE. There were an awful lot of people learned an awful lot of things to work on this one program. It took about 2,000 man years. It took nine years. Four million hours of engineering technicians and administrative support. So it's, it was a big effort, but, and it took a long time because of the fact of the shuttle accident and then to redesign. I think the thing that, that John pointed out was the test program. In the end, I remember the day of the launch, I had called the project manager and said to him, we have done everything we can do. We had tested everything. And as far as I was concerned, this spacecraft needs to get out of here and off the ground before anybody. It was, it was completely tested. Now I can tell you that there were some tests that I took it upon myself to defer to a higher level of assembly. And I, and I think in order to maintain schedules, you can defer a test, but you can never eliminate a test. Whether it's Hubble or any other program, you can defer it, but don't eliminate it. I think, and I'm not advocating all of these points for, for all of your different projects, but the point was when we went from the shuttle to a Delta program, the only way we were gonna do this in a fast period of time was to put everybody together. So we put all of the engineers in a skunk works mode, which I think fortunately they, they now know that those people that worked on this know that you can do this fast if they all work together, co-located together. The other thing is we had a war room, which was really a schedule room, and we had every schedule, every perch schedule on, in the, in the room, 
and we had every every subsystem person responsible for that schedule. His name was on that schedule. And every two weeks, we would bring people in, and psychologically, they would look around, and they would determine who was on the critical path. And if they got on it, their name would be there. We actually were going to put photographs up, but we didn't get to them. I think the other thing that, I, that I've seen on various programs is to do peer reviews. I mean, we've had PDRs and CDRs and mission readiness reviews, but my opinion is the peer review of every subsystem in great detail, without a lot of view graphs, but just detailed drawings and detailed schematics, we did peer reviews, I would say, every six months with experts that we brought in. The other thing, back in 1988, system engineering, which I personally believe in and, and think that's the way you should design a program, our system engineering was done by the fact that we brought in the three top engineers in NASA, George Henshawood, <coughs> Bob Martin, and John Webb. One, one reviewed every single mechanical design on that program it, for about nine months, and he was off and to review everything. Bob Martin actually reviewed every electrical circuit. He made changes on John's instrument by doing spice analysis, and we let those people alone they were not involved with schedules, and they were to come back and tell us what it was that they should do that we should correct along the way. And George Henshelwood was brought in. He was, he's an expert on launch vehicles, and he was brought in to evaluate the entire Delta launch vehicle because it, the point was when you design it for a shuttle and then put it on a Delta, there's all kinds of changes with acoustics and random vibration and loads. The, uh, the thing about, well, I'll tell you another thing. The quality assurance people, I personally sleep at night knowing they're there. I know some people would like them to go home. But I can tell you that because of they, were, they were there and the fact that they were empowered to make decisions and to stop, periodically they would call me from the clean room and tell me that someone was going to skip a few steps in a procedure and we they they would call me and tell me they're going to shut them down and i absolutely agreed with them every time i can tell you that i personally read every guide depth that came out which is an alert system i kept waiting for a smoking gun near the end of a program where some resistor across the board has a failure rate but i think all of you that manage programs and system engineers you should read every one of those and determine if there's a problem on your program. The other thing is we did, as I mentioned before, we did defer some testing. Uh, I can tell you that we actually deferred a test on John Mather's instrument. I knowingly did it to maintain the schedule. And near the end of the program, the entire satellite was put over horizontally to see 5,000 pounds hanging horizontal after all this work was, but it turned out that John's calibrator did not work. It did not go into his instrument. We had to, we, we had to warm the door up, spend six weeks fixing that calibrator. So I deferred that test to maintain the schedule and it didn't work. But the fact was we did not eliminate that test. The other thing that we did, which I was asked to do this and suggested by the chief scientist at NASA, was when Kobe was completely qualified, we put it in a clean room, in an RF room, and we ran two wires to, to power the system and we let it run for two weeks. No one near it. And we cycled the room. It was in air, but we cycled the room from 15 to 35 centigrade. And we let the, let the satellite run and the point of this was, I was told that the scientists needed to learn the characteristics of that satellite when it's just operating, with the wheels coming on and off, the gyros, and that's what we did. We, we let it run for two weeks, no one touched it. If you're a project manager, I can tell you that the key to this whole thing is to have them be able to talk to you. I mean. I was involved with a, with a launch vehicle, 
and a technician came down off the gantry and he had broken a connector. And he told the vice president of Boeing, he walked in and told him, I broke the connector. The vice president said, all right, let's go get, find another connector and we'll fix it. If that man had yelled at that technician, he might not come down and tell him the next time. So I can tell you, part of my job was to be there and let those people, and they were there every day with a problem or a concern, but they knew they could talk to us. So I was asked, because this was unique, how did I learn how to do this? And periodically people would come up and say, how do you know what you're doing? <laughs> I think what, when I look back, I, I remember being a young engineer at Goddard and I used to watch project managers. I don't know why I was doing it, but I watched them. And I think there were such a diverse group of personalities, as John pointed out, there were so many different types of project managers. Some would listen, some would rant and rave, some would just make decisions without discussing it. I think I learned how to do this by watching them. In my, in my wallet is a little piece of paper that says two letters on it. It says BP. And I've been through more meetings and more projects and more commotion at NASA. And I, but I opened up that little piece of paper quite often. It's to be professional, to be prudent, to be practical, and be protective of the people and the hardware, and also to persevere. The only way to get this done is to make small steps of progress every day. You're not gonna, I mean, periodically, I'll tell you this now, I would come in and go, oh, this is overwhelming. We've gone from the shuttle to the Delta, we're gonna redesign it all, and we told people downtown we'd do it in three years. But, period, but over time, little by little, each day you'd make a little bit of progress. And I can tell you near the end of a program that the workers take over. And for the last six months, they finish it. I think the, the other thing is, and I think for your various programs, and I'll talk to you tomorrow about FUSE, I feel strongly there's three parts to this equation, the ground system, the instruments, and the spacecraft. And I think the way you can control a program is to buy two and develop one. But when you try to develop three systems, a ground system, an instrument, and a spacecraft, the iterations go on and on and on. So if you can, and you'll hear about what we did on FUSE tomorrow, but if you can fix the ground system and fix the spacecraft and develop the instruments, which is what we did on COBE, it, it'll work much better. Oh, the last cute part is we, we took the Kobe hydrazine system and we told them we would do it for so much money we'd we redesign it and the hydrazine system was like $5 million. So we sold it to the Air Force and don't ask me what they did but it's, it's up there doing something. And I thought we had $5 million more. <laughs> the $5 million went to the United States Treasury and I've never seen it. That's it.